This is the Kalahari Desert. Covering 900,000 square kilometers, the Kalahari is one of Africa's most hostile and demanding of habitats. Yet for centuries, this unfriendly environment has been home to one of the oldest cultures on the planet, the sand of Southern Africa. For thousands of years, the sand were the only inhabitants of the whole of Southern Africa. They lived as hunter-gatherers, hunting with bows and arrows, moving from place to place in search of game, roots and berries. Today, after centuries of oppression and poverty, this ancient race is facing extermination. The San community is to a large extent a left behind community. And the San have always been the one part of our country who've been treated like slaves by other parts of the country. And it's not a white black thing, it's, it's, it's all over. You find the San people here, they struggle. They don't have the knowledge, they don't, they don't have the schools. As the sun people who are left there behind. All the people they say are the sun people, if they believe they're behind, it's true. Okay, then we might as well do it now. Sebastian Titero is a humanitarian dedicated to helping remote tribes around the world. Having worked with numerous tribes on five continents, Sebastian does more than mere handouts. He's been working with the San for over 16 years. Yet, despite his benevolent activities, Sebastian fears for their survival. In 98, when they adopted me, the chief of my village gave me the three names that I have, Kaopo, Kamwanga. And he looked at me and he said, you are the voice of the Junwan Sea people in the world from now on. The San, also known as the Bushmen of Southern Africa, are hunter-gatherers, solely dependent upon the land for sustenance. They live by the axiom, the day comes, the day gives. They have a very close connection with the natural world around them. The word evil does not exist in their vocabulary. The ultimate concern for the San is survival. The life in the Kalahari here is, is both free and hard. People here suffer of thirst, of hunger, of diseases as, such as malaria, TB. And yet the freedom they have makes them feel for this place. It's hot during the day, it's cold during the night. If you ask a, a sand person, would you like to move out of the Kalahari, his complete and definite answer is no, I will never leave from this place. Every year, even Sebastian come and come see my house and uh, tell me what you don't want to build another house. So I tell Sebastian, please, the power is nothing. This is the actual cave that the Bushmen were decimated uh, about a hundred years ago. They say that around 800 in one day were killed here. It's believed that several million San once inhabited southern Africa. But as the centuries passed, things began to change. The Bantu tribes start pushing in from the north and then the colonizers from the south. These people were left with the surviving in the Kalahari, which is the harshest place in Africa. So we're looking at a very large population of sand that doesn't exist anymore. You know, they, they're widespread all over Africa. They found rock paintings from the caves of Egypt all the way to Cape Town. Uh, today they're not even considered a tribe or a nation. They're just scattered families of Kung and Junwansi and and Kobe Bushman and so forth. Today, the San are confined to reservations within the Kalahari Desert. In 1961, the Botswana government established the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, and restricted the Bushmen to living inside the reserve. The apartheid regime established Bushman land in Namibia for the same purpose. Currently, there are approximately 90,000 San living in Southern Africa, the majority of them located in Botswana and Namibia. Even today, they're marginalized as underdeveloped and incompetent. They're not permitted to farm the land on the reserves, nor can they continue living as hunter-gatherers. The land they once called home, their hunting ground, 
is gradually sectioned, sold or encroached upon by nearby dominating tribes. Even here in this area, the heroes come from Botswana and came and say, no, this area was not for Bushmen, it's for, it's, it's for us, heroes. And then the Bushmen move from Gam and go to Chomkesai. And in this year, 2009, the heroes come from Gam also and come in Chomkui and say, no, Chomkui was not for, for Bushmen, it's for, for us. Now, that's why you see, every time the Bushmen don't have right to do anything, you see. Apparently, there is a new law in Namibia that the Bushmen cannot hunt anymore on their land. There were several cases where the Bushmen hunted some kudu and they were put in jail in Rutfontein for about six months. It's one of the tough things to deal with because this is, this is their food. It's the only food they have left. They're not allowed now to raise uh, crops or to raise cattle. Uh, they can't hunt, so they're really uh, handcuffed on this. So what we're trying to change here is give them a farm in which they will have food, vegetables and crops to, to eat and also convince the government to let them hunt on the land because this is their ancestral land and I think it's, it's their right. We have divided our map in four districts and we have allocated, okay, this portion of this area is for wildlife only. So whenever a person is found hunting without an official permit, he or she will face charges against the poaching what he committed. Change is never easy, but if you can see a reason for the change, then I think it's easier to go through the process. But if we now say to people, you must stop being hunter-gatherers, but we don't give them something else to hang on to, and we don't give them a new purpose in life, then there's no reason for them to want to make this change. The identity of the Sun people is hunter and gatherer. They're people that know intricate details of their own homeland. They can walk and know what animal has passed moments beforehand. Amazing trackers. They can smell the scent of animals on trees. This is what it is to be a Sun person. But they're in a situation now by saying that they can't hunt then they can't provide. And the berries, the fruits, the roots and everything like that are seasonal. It seems to me that they have to adapt or they will cease to be and it will be a sad thing. By far the most acute need for the San is the availability of water. A bushman can survive on 200 millilitres of water a day. Every drop is preserved for human consumption. If you look around, Kalahari doesn't look like a desert. It has bushes and trees. But because it has no surface water, it's considered a desert. Now this makes it extremely hard to survive here. Under the Kalahari lies the greatest underground lake on the planet. It's called the Dragon's Breath. These people have now a chance with our water systems to have pure water without filtration, without purification, straight from underground, 60 meters, 50 meters, 40 meters, and straight into their buckets or in their faucets so they can drink pure, clean water from underground. In 2001, Pilgrim Relief Society began installing solar-powered water systems in sand villages in the Kalahari Desert. This subterranean water supply is not a recent discovery. During the South African-Angolan War, also known as the Namibian War of Independence, the military drilled boreholes throughout the Kalahari Desert to provide their troops with drinking water. Only a small number of hand pumps remain of those installed during that period. So all we do now is we go to villages that have no water or have hand pumps or diesel pumps that are broken. We replace those with our solar 
powered water systems in which we have a submersible pump, a cable and a solar power panel and that draws power from the sun and then we give them fresh water. The solar pumps are called Grund for us, they're German made, they're extremely reliable. They pump through mud and sand and everything, strong, tough, reliable utensils. I installed a, a water system 11 years ago in a village and it's still pumping water. Do not let go, only from the frame and do not let go. Okay, here we go. Here it is. What do you want then? Come, come, come. Good job. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. What is water? He was thirsty. Uh, very good. Very good. Good job. Good job. Good job. <laughs> Last year, one of the guys from Makuri village was a village like uh, 60Ks from Tsumkwe. He came to us and they tell us that um, he needs a water system because the elephant destroyed the old one, so he needs a new one. Uh, immediately we go there to install that, that uh, system and when we get there all the people they sitting down on the ground they don't uh, raise up then we ask them what's going on and they tell us that they didn't drink water for two days in just 15 minutes we install the water system and we give them water to drink well it's hard to explain but uh, it transforms their life you walk to a village that Two months ago, didn't have water. They were walking 20 miles in the bush. Three, four young people with small canisters of water to pick up from a different village, so little water from a hand pump and walk back to the village. Suddenly they have a system that pumps 800 liters an hour into a tank of five tons. I, I walked one time to a village and the kids were washing the, their bodies with the water from the water system, which is for me a tremendous miracle. But now with this excess water, they plant gardens. Water here is truly giving them new life because these people look better, uh, they're happier, they live longer because they have a better chance because of this water. There are 186 villages between Botswana and Namibia of the Sand Tribe. My dream would be to have every village of the sand with a solar power water system. The garden was originally created for bushmen to see fast developing plants, tomatoes, eggplants watermelon, cantaloupes, different ways of growing corn. Then once they tried something, they had the opportunity to tell us, I like this, I don't like this. Everyone said I like the watermelon. So we give them watermelon seeds, spend some time with them in their actual village. Then they grow their own things. They understand the concepts of it, but they don't understand the concepts of time, so to speak. You tell them that they've got to water it once a day. To them, that's once whenever they have spare water. They see, say, a watermelon growing and it gets to the size of their foot. They think it's ready, they will cut it, and it's not ready. You need to show them step by step. Mm. 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 Mm.